One of the phrases we used in this booklet at the time to describe who we are is that we want to be a church of diverse communities of people living out the gospel together. Today, I want to talk about what does it mean to live out the gospel together? You know, that word gospel, it's it's something that we um, hear a lot. It's become a bit of a churchy word, hasn't it? 2,000 years ago, it was a reasonably common term. A common term just meant good news. But not, um, I guess, just good news of, you know, the regular good news type, like, hey, there's a sale happening in Briscoe's this weekend. Uh, But more the, you know, radical good news. You know, I I guess maybe a term that we might use to describe that today would be uh, groundbreaking news. You know, something flashes on the screen, you know, breaking news, and people gather around and they, they all lean in to, to see or to hear what's happening. Back then, that breaking news would be uh, news of, of a victory in war or a, or a new king that had ascended, and people would, would gather around and hear that. They would, they would celebrate and they would cheer because they knew that everything was radically changing from this point on. The early writers of the New Testament took this word gospel, this Word good news of breaking news, and they, they used this word to describe how, how God had stepped into our world and the, the radical impact that would have in their lives and, and throughout the world. It's the gospel. And, and rather than just think about you know, a whole lot of different initiatives that you know, we've got planned for the rest of the year, even though we can't do some of that, I, I want to make sure that we really understand what gospel this breaking news of Jesus is all about. You see, without understanding this, we're at the risk of, you know, you might attend a a program or two or in a service or two and and not really connected to this groundbreaking news. Or or you might, you know, clock in and clock out on a Sunday, but not really see how this good news affects everything. In fact, you, you might leave here and and see that it has no bearing to your work life, which is, you know, 50% of your waking hours is at work. You, you might leave here and, and see that it has no bearing, you know, to the 45 hours that you spend at home. You know, effectively, you only spend 2 or 3% of, you know, your life here, tops. And the gospel affects not just what we do together in these different programs and services. It affects everything, sends its ripples out to every single thing we do. See, while it's huge news, what I've found is that a lot of Christians think of the gospel as something, something that happened in the past. You know, a historical event where we, we sat down and we embraced something, we received something, we became a follower of Jesus, and, and that's the gospel, and that's kind of all we need to do with the gospel. And, and we often don't see much of an impact in our lives from there on in. And it was good news that happened then, but we don't seem to embrace that and, and with a sense of celebration and excitement today. Or, or it might be, you know, not just a, a past thing we did, but we might just see it as, you know, part of it. You know, I meet a lot of Christians who seem to have got part of the good news. It's like they, they came around this breaking news story. They, they heard some of the broadcast, but they didn't hear all of it. And so as a result, they, they get really excited about this particular part of the good news, but, but don't realize the radical nature that has in all the other spheres of home and work and society and our city and our life and all these different things it directs us to. And the reason I, I know that is because that, that's my story. You know, I grew up in, in church. I heard people talk about, you know, this thing, the gospel. And, and at the age of 10, I responded to enter into a relationship with God and thought I knew about the gospel, thought I'd embraced, you know, all of the gospel and and yet as I have grown in my Christian journey and as I've opened God's Word and understood God's Word, there's a sense where, wow, there was so much more to it than what I realized there was to it. And suddenly, this little bit I had, which was pretty cool, suddenly understanding there is a whole bunch more to that good news story, this breaking news story. It's radical and affects every single sphere of life. And if we're going to be a church of diverse communities living out the gospel together, I want to ensure that every single one of us here leaves today with an understanding that the good news is not just something back here that's one part of our lives, but something that affects every single thing. And so I have four trees up here, as you can see. 
I want to kind of go through, I guess, the biblical story, anchor us into the big story of God, help us understand this, the nature, this radical nature of this gospel story and the different spheres that it affects. The first sphere that it affects is the part that I heard growing up quite a bit, and it's a radical part of the good news story. It's probably not going to be new to you. The first part the gospel affects is our relationship with God. Normally when I heard the gospel story mentioned, it normally began with bad news. There was a problem with me and it needed to be fixed. But actually the story of God doesn't begin with bad news. It begins with the good. We come to life in a garden, a garden called Eden, right? In the very beginning, we read in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and God steps in, and he, and he takes something where there was nothing, and He, and he makes something, and, and each day, over six days, God, God saw, and he, he spoke, and at the end of that day, He says, it was good. And at the end of those six, and, and good means that it simply is what it was meant to be. It, it is what, what God had in mind functioning in, in the right way. On the sixth day, God formed people, and, and he made this garden. He, he actually cultivated himself. He landscapes it himself, and it's this garden called Eden. Eden means something like bliss or delight, this garden of bliss. It's, it's, a, it's a garden of delight. It's, it's a garden where you come, and it's this real utopia to step into. And in that garden, God makes Adam and Eve, and he places them there. And we read that they... We're in this garden and that they're able to relate to God, they're able to walk with God. You see, God created us for relationship with himself. There's a couple of things about Eden that you need to tuck away. Eden uh, was, had all these rivers flowing in it. Uh, Eden had these precious jewels that you kind of see all around the rivers, kind of tuck that away because it'll relate to our last tree in a moment. And Adam and Eve could walk around the garden and they could eat from the various fruit that were, that were right in the garden. There was one particular tree in the garden, as you know, called the tree of life. And they could take from that fruit and they could eat it to their heart's delight and it would sustain them. It would give them life. Enjoyable, good news, radical, groundbreaking news story. It all begins with God creating people for relationship. But you know that that's not where the story finishes. The story also has something that we'll call the bad. It's why the tree shrivels, doesn't it? Suddenly, the world and this relationship with God is not the way it's meant to be. And we know in that Garden of Eden, there was another tree called the knowledge of the tree of, of good and evil. And God said, you can eat from any tree. You know, knock yourselves off, savor every part of the fruit. But this is one particular tree. You see, God invites us into relationship with himself, but he never enforces himself upon us. He never pushes himself on us. He gives a choice. He says, you can live any way you want to, or you can live as, as I design you and I call you to live. And you know the story. First couple took matters into their own hands. They decided to be in the place of God themselves and determine what is right and what is wrong. And as a result, strife entered into their relationship with God. Things shriveled up. Things dried up. It all looks pretty dead. You know, this isn't just something that happened then. Something that happened in some garden long time ago. It still happens in our lives today, doesn't it? God calls us to a particular way of life. He defines what's right and wrong. And, and each one of us, at least at some point in life, have decided to define life on our own terms and placed ourselves in the, the place of God and done things in our own way. We seek our identity, our purpose outside of the life with our Creator. And because they acted alone, because we continue to act alone, this relationship with God becomes hurt and strained and shrivels. But you know, the rest of the story, that the new, that Jesus steps in, and the very plan of God began right at the moment in this garden where the couple were expelled from the garden, expelled from entrance to the, the tree of life. And, but Jesus steps in. 
And he does everything that's necessary. He he did what no human being has ever done. The the Son of God enters into our world and he takes on every sin, every wrong decision, every time that we have turned our back on God. He takes all of that upon himself somehow and he takes on the consequences of that and he dies. Takes on this shriveled world and he brings new life. And suddenly blossoms are formed and, and and we read this in 2 Corinthians. Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It goes on. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. The gospel says we're not reconciled to God because of our own efforts or abilities or making some kind of right choice, but because of what Jesus does. And when we respond to what he has done in faith. And suddenly the spring-like flower comes forth in our lives and it blossoms and, and we enjoy the good news. But it doesn't just end here. It finishes with, with the perfect. The end of the Bible finishes with people who come to know God again, coming into this garden once again. In fact, the story of the Bible begins with a garden. It ends with a garden. And and the writers of Scripture go out of their way to to highlight that actually this is like Eden, but it's not Eden anymore. It it, it has also a river flowing through the city. It has uh, all these jewels, sapphire and and gold and all these different descriptions that Revelation gives us at the very end of the Bible. And, and then it says there's a tree in the garden, tree in this city too, just like it was back in Eden. There is a tree of life, but it's not just one singular tree. Now it's more like a vine on both sides of the river, and it's accessible. In fact, even when you drink of the, the, the water from the river, it does exactly what the tree of life does. It sustains. It gives life. And we read at the very end of time, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be, with, uh, will be their God. Suddenly, this good news story has all come to an end. It's all the way it's meant to be. That's the part of the good news story that I grew up with. And it's a part of the good news story that we need to continue to tell because it's so important to us. That's why we have so many different things like uh, English classes and, and CAP and CAP Job Club and, and mainly music and all these different things we do. And in our services, making sure they're accessible to everyone because we want to make sure everyone around us hears the story that we were in relationship with God originally and it broke. And, and the good news is that we can come back into relationship with God for all eternity. And that's why on your seats there is this invite card. It's not for you because you're already here. <laughs> It's for you to pass to someone else that you meet. Perhaps you meet somebody over the next few days or week and and, and they're new to the city and you can say, hey, you should come to my church because it's a great opportunity to meet some other people. We have these groups and I'll introduce you to a few people and and there's space on the back of the card for you to write details down. It might be your details. It might be how they get in contact with somebody here. Or it might be that you meet somebody from from another country and then you and, and somehow you write down some details about free English classes that we have here each week. Or it might be that, uh, as I found, you know, I had a neighbor, still have a neighbor, he's out of work, so when I heard that the other day, I was saying, hey, um, we we have this job club down at our church. If you need some help just getting your resume together or, um, you know, some interview skills because it's been a while for him, you know, have job club, they'd love to be able to help you out. You know, just writing some details down and passing it to someone. Great opportunity for each of us to do that. And we'll continue to do things like that. In fact, this year we'll also have four big events that we will do as a church. Uh, So Easter, we'll have this Easter art installation outside of our church. We'll talk more about that another day. Uh, Middle of the year, we're having this uh, mid-year Christmas party. And by party, I mean like big party. Uh, In October, we have this international festival kind of all down the car park and hopefully down the street. And then a, a new Christmas event we'll have at the end of the year. All these different events, all like these programs, because we want people to come into relationship with God. Now, that's probably not new news to any of you here. 
And if you are new here and you haven't responded to that part of the good news, you know, I would hope today is the day you respond to this part of the good news. We would love to help you understand what that looks like and to, to take a step of faith. And I did that when I was 10 years old. And I'm so happy I did that. That day I became a follower of Jesus. But while I embrace this part of the good news, it's not all of the good news. You see, often the way it was packaged to me is, um, you know, it's, it's almost like this eternal life insurance policy. It, it, you know, you, you, you kind of do this now and you're, you're set with God for life. And in and, and my mind, as a child, I was just going to be floating in the clouds with God forever. It kind of denied this kind of physical space at the end. And it was always described to me like this worship service that would go on for eternity, which I kind of smiled and pretended that I was really going to enjoy, but it didn't sound all that good. Uh, but I guess better than the alternative. Uh, and that's really not the whole story. And this is what I want to talk about today, because I think many of us get confused. Many of us have just heard that God is interested in saving souls, and we forget that there's actually more to us than just our soul. You see, the gospel not just affects our relationship with God, it also has something to do with renewing people and all of people. You see, each of us have a body and intellect and emotions and choices. And, and right at the beginning, as we come through the story again, we see God made us that way. He made us with these bodies. He made us with these emotions and intellect. And he thinks it's good. It's good. He doesn't get ashamed of the physical world we are part of. The bad news, though, is that as soon as we made choices to turn our back on God, it affected everything about us. Our intellect is not as sharp as it needs to be. Our emotions can't always be trusted. Our instinct can't always be trusted. We kind of plunge into these different addictions, and we, we kind of go south in so many different things. We can't trust our choices anymore on the hunches we have. story about the new is that Jesus steps in, even into this condition, and, and he wants to renew us from the inside out. And so when Jesus was here on earth, he would give us tasters of what the gospel does, and he would heal people who were physically unwell. He would free people who were in bondage all of their lives. He gave sight to the blind. All these as tasters of what he is able and will ultimately do in our lives. It's why the New Testament also encourages us to allow the Spirit of God to do deep work inside of us, renewing us from the inside out to deal with our faulty emotions and choices and to purify us. That's why Titus chapter 2 says things like this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us, this grace, this gospel teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. Glorious appearing of God, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You see, the good news story is not just our relationship with God, but God is renewing us, not just claiming our soul, but changing us, and that ultimately one day we come to the perfect, when our bodies will work the way they were meant to work, and we will be in a physical world that God has renewed, and where our emotions are good again, we can trust them, that we're free of addictions. In fact, the wording of the very end of the Bible says things like this, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more, neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. God is renewing all things, every single part of us. You see, somehow when I was growing up, I always heard this thing about my relationship with God, but no one really spoke to me about, well, actually the gospel means something every day of our lives, that something needs to be changing on the inside of us. You see, that's why as a church community, we invest so many resources and opportunities and environments to help us grow, catalysts to help us grow. 
And that's why today I'll be asking you to take some next steps. Talk about this later. I want all of us to be taking next steps. I don't want to see any of us plateau, but all of us allowing the Spirit of God to to use different opportunities, different environments to do something in our lives that we would be renewed from the inside out, allowing the Spirit of God to change the way we think and feel and act. That's why our preaching, we try to be uh, you know, full of application, full about life, about what God calls us to do, because God is interested in renewing us from the inside out. Now, if we stop right there, it would be, again, a breaking news story for us. But the gospel still has so much more to say, not just about my relationship with God, not just about how he wants us to renew people and be renewed, but about our relationships with each other and with others. So again, the gospel story, as you think about these four movements, can be told around this part of things as well. That at the very beginning, God, the good news story is God created you and me as community beings. Just as God is a community being, he creates us as community people. That's why we have this yearning for relationship. That's why people can sit down and watch a show like Coronation Street or enter into some reality TV show because there's something in us that that wants to immerse ourselves in the stories of others, even in a superficial way. We have this yearning to be connected, and it begins right here at the very beginning of the story. God created us as these relational people, and he, and he brings Adam and Eve together. Hey, before he brings Eve, when God saw all that he saw, and he sees Adam in the garden all alone, just in his relationship with God, remember what God said? It is not good for the man to be alone, because the way God created Adam was to be a relational being. And so he creates Eve and he brings them together. And they trust each other. And there is this harmony between them. There's no walls between them, the passage talks about. But we come to the bad. You know the story again. They take the fruit from the knowledge of the good, of the tree of good and evil. Remember the very first thing, the very first consequence that affects. The very first thing they see is not their relationship with God that's broken. The very first thing they experience and they see is that there's disunity now between Adam and Eve. See, when God made them, they were were together. They trusted each other. There was no shame. But but suddenly here, they want to hide from each other. They, you know, sew fig leaves together to to try to hide, to put some boundary and some walls between each other. and, And they feel ashamed of who they are. This explains why, isn't it? that we feel tension in relationships. It's as old as the tree. You know, it begins right there. Before even murder enters, that doesn't take very long. Very next chapter of the Bible, Genesis 4, their children, Adam and Eve's children, you know, murder steps into the story. But this is why two people who once had such a high regard for each other now turn their backs on each other and wound and attack. The very first thing we tend to do is not to reach out, but to cover up and to hide. This is why when people ask you how you're doing, our instinctive reaction is to say, I'm fine. Really? Oh yeah, nothing could be better. When deep down we're going through a really tough time, but we're ashamed or we don't want people to know. But you see, the good news story is that Jesus steps into our relational dysfunctional messes and he's able to bring us together and thread us together into experiencing healthy relationships once again. He brings us together in this church. And the church right here should be the one place we can be completely authentic about our messes, about our pain, about our difficulties, about the poor choices that we have made. We don't have to be ashamed of those things because Jesus steps in and he's wanting to to thread us together. And to bring us together into a wider family of God made up of different ethnicities and different ages and different backgrounds and different postal codes and and bring us together to do life together. It's one of the reasons we have our our small groups, our cell groups. 
And, and we encourage you, as we'll be doing today, to, to step into one of those because this is the best way to do life with others, to ensure that you are known and that you are encouraged and you're part of the journey with others so that we, we get to do this with each other. We have friends here who help us along the way. And that's why at the very beginning of the Bible, we see all these diverse communities coming together in deep friendship where there is no sin and no bondage and no walls, but this trust and intimacy with each other. There's some implications for us understanding this part of the gospel story. Those relationships can affect a whole bunch of things. They can affect our homes. That Jesus is at work renewing homes. You see, that's why here at GCC we have this Faith at Home Center, wanting to provide resources to proactively help you in your relationships at home. You know, in a world where dysfunction in marriages, dysfunctions in flats, dysfunction between parents and children exist everywhere, we want to do all we can to allow the gospel to renew homes. You know, one of the stats I shared with you late last year is that 85% of church-going families, this is a New Zealand statistic, have no faith conversations at home. 85% don't have any. We want to change that because we believe it's the gospel that changes homes, that brings parents together, that brings children together, that allows this work, renewing work, to happen. It's why we invest so much in new generations, because we want to pass the baton of faith on to generations who will come beyond us. It's why we invest so much in, in our Nehi Army and Mania and Blueprint and all these different children's and youth ministries and programs we have, because we want them to embrace the gospel and to allow this work of renewal to happen in their own lives. It's why at the moment we're asking questions around what does it mean for us to be involved in schools in our area? The team of people meeting next week to take some next steps because we have this dream to place uh, Christian youth workers in secondary schools in, in central Auckland working at this, allowing the gospel to renew relationships and renew, uh, renew the intellect and the learning and come to know who, who God is and, and the call of life that he has for them. The gospel renews relationships. It also affects something else. You see, often we kind of think about this one, and when we think about church being kind of the, the way we do that for the 2 or 3% of our, of our time that we have, we often don't think about the way it affects our relationships, particularly at home, you know, where we have 45% of our, our life is at home. But most of us certainly don't think about the way it affects our communities like our working communities. The gospel has something significant to say about work, where we spend 50% of our waking hours. See, again, as you think about the four movements of the story, it begins here with the good. God created work. And it is a good thing. Right at the beginning, when he placed Adam in the garden, he said to Adam, Lord God took the, the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. You know, those two terms, work and take care of, are, are used throughout the first five books of the Old Testament to refer to what priests do. God is giving Adam a priestly role, this kind of sacred role, even though all he's doing is being in this garden, you know, cultivating and doing landscaping, I guess protecting the garden from maybe like scorpions or snakes or whatever. He, he's in this garden doing different things, but he's actually doing what God has been doing. Remember in the very first chapter of the Bible, God sees something and he, and he forms and he fills. And right throughout the, the, the first chapter, you read about God forming and God filling and God is at work. And then he calls us, his people that he's created, to do what God has done too, to be involved in forming and filling and cultivating, to be involved in what God is doing in this world as well. To work is meant to be a wonderful thing. But obviously, when we step into the bad, we realize that work now is hard. The work is frustrating. You ever feel that? You ever face those moments of frustration? You feel the pain, you, you get to work and you have this headache with your boss, or you have this headache with some of your staff, and it's just hard and it's painful. 
And you kind of go, what were they thinking? The story of the Bible reminds us why there is now a divide between secular and sacred. Why there is blame shifting, power struggles, deceit and greed, dishonesty, selfishness, stress. Why we envision that we can do so much more than we can actually ever accomplish. Why we work in a system that seems so stacked against us. Why we have so many dissatisfying experiences. But there's hope. The blossoms of spring come through as we understand that Jesus steps in and and wants to do something in our lives to bring renewal to the lives of our work environments. That he's able to take even the bad and place us into these communities harmed by what has happened to be agents of change, to use people like you and me to create environments in which people can flourish where they see grace and truth and hope and beauty. That what you do, whatever it is, you don't just do because of the opportunities to evangelize, though that's a good thing. You don't just do because of the, uh, you know, when you earn money, you can give more to the church, though that's a really good thing too. You, you do it because what you do is, is modeling what God does. What, what, what you do is been reflective of the image of God, the God who forms and fills and cultivates and bring, brings order out of chaos and, and beauty when it lacked before, developing and changing, and, and God loves this. You see, as your pastor, I, I want to make sure that we understand work matters. It's a good thing albeit now a frustrating thing. But God places us right where we are for people to see glimpses of this new kingdom life that God is up to, where at the very end of time, God is able and will renew all things. You know, we could look at a whole bunch of other areas where these spheres where the gospel is meant to take root. We could look at uh, areas like disabilities. And one of the things we're doing as a pastoral team at the moment is just researching what does it look like uh, as a church to be involved in allowing the gospel to bring renewal to people who are facing intellectual disabilities and families who, who suffer from uh, people in their families with intellectual disabilities. A huge sector of our society and, and as a church, we're trying to, what does it look like for us as a church to be to be part of what God might be calling us to do there. Uh, We can look at things like our city. What does it mean for the gospel to take shape in our city and to change things? After all, we we read in Jeremiah, this call where God says to the people, work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare, and determine I will determine your welfare. It's one of the reasons last year we were involved in CityServe. All these different projects around the city where people could see the gospel at work, bringing beauty and order and renewal to what was happening. You see, throughout the centuries, local churches made up of ordinary people like you and me have stepped out. Ordinary men, women, and children have brought the whole gospel to the whole of their lives. Together, followers of Jesus have begun civil rights movements. They've elevated the status of women. They've developed hospitals and universities, influenced arts and political theory, human rights and dignity, education, compassion, and the love of enemies. They've introduced Jesus to complete strangers who soon became friends, and lives were radically renewed from the inside out. You see, the gospel is not just God has a wonderful plan for your life, but more than that, he has a wonderful plan for the whole world. It's the coming of God's kingdom to renew everything. As Jesus says, behold, I am making all things new. Jesus is involved in renewing people and places, and he gives us this mission to be involved in what he's doing renewing people and places. You see, the church is a colony of heaven, populated by people like you and me whose citizenship is not here, but it's in heaven. And in this colony where we walk to the beat of a different drum, living the life that God intended us to live, 
living as people set free. And when people see glimpses of what we do and how we live, it's meant to entice them and see different aspects of this good news story. Perhaps they've never been around the radio or the TV to see that groundbreaking news. But somehow through what we do at work and home and various programs and initiatives, we give them a taste of what is to come. And I want every single one of us to embody this good news story because it affects every sphere of our lives. It affects our relationship with God. It affects the way God renews us from the inside out. It affects our relationships with each other. Homes, new generations, schools, work, city, you know, everything, everything. And so I'd like you to take the sheet of paper, the next steps card that you received in your bulletin when you came in today. Because I'd like to ask you to consider what it looks like for you to step more into the story of renewing people and places. In the foyer on your way out today, uh, there's a whole lot of tables, there'll be a whole lot of activities there to entice you to stay. We have an ice cream truck and we have, you know, some brownies at the table so you can kind of enjoy that and kind of enjoy just hanging out with each other. And I want you to get around the tables and find out what's happening and take some next steps. Uh, our kids' ministries will be going longer today too, so if you have children, uh, they'll be in there till, you know, 10.45, so you've got time to hang around and to see what's going on. Here's what I'm asking that you would think about what's the next step you need to take so that you don't plateau in your life, but that you allow God to be renewing you and that you would also take steps to be involved in this process of, of renewing people and places. So there's different links here like the Bible. And you can go on our website and there's uh, you know, Bible apps, there's Bible reading plans, different Bible studies that we're advertising. There's right now media that we have, you know, 10,000 different videos, uh, resources to help you understand the Bible. There's worship. Committing to come every Sunday. And I would ask you to commit to coming every Sunday during this Jaywalk series we begin next week. As we open the Bible to Mark's gospel and we, and we ask this question, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to take on this radical task of following Jesus? The step for you here might be meeting Jesus. And out on the table out here is uh, some help through that. Uh, we have a program called Alpha. might be the, the best group for you to be in with other people where you can just explore Christianity. Or it might be that you've never gone public with your faith through baptism and, and that's kind of your next step to take. Or it might be starting point. Brian alluded to that earlier, that if you're new or newish to our church and wanting to find out who we are, starting point might be the next step for you. It might be generosity. You know, our ministries here are all funded by ordinary people like, like you and me. And uh, it might be that you've been coming here for a while but just haven't kind of financially partnered with what's going on. Maybe that's the next step for you to take too. You can find out more about that at one of the tables. It might be connecting in a group. You know, groups aren't just a nice thing we do here, but they're crucial and a significant strategic element to what we do. And because we believe in groups so much, we even provide free babysitting to enable young families or single parents to be able to attend a group. And all you need to do is let us know your babysitting costs and we'll kind of reimburse you at a set rate for that too. And then join a team. You know, at the tables out here, you will see a range of different programs that's going on. I'm asking that every single one of us would be involved in one of these. It's an opportunity to step in and be part of this renewing work that we're doing here at, at GCC. So you can go to different tables and find out about new generation ministries and our creative teams and different programs in the community and all these different things. And perhaps you're already serving. It's just a really good opportunity to find out more about what's going on so that when you pick up that you know, invite card and you're meeting people, uh, you can invite people specifically to different things because you're in the know. You know what's happening here. You know, Ali and Tyler are going to come out now and are going to sing a, a song item to us, kind of bringing all of this together about God's renewing work in our lives and in our world. While they're singing, I want you to, um, you know, consider just, just leaning in and um, asking that the Spirit of God would help you take steps where you can be renewed in your own soul and asking that God would use you to 
be part of this work of renewing people and places. You know, I don't think I've ever been as excited about ministry as in this current season. There are so, so many opportunities for us to step into as a church. We're seeing people come to know Jesus. We're seeing people take radical steps of baptism, opening the Bible, giving and serving. And I can't wait for us as a church to see every single one of us embrace the whole gospel and see the way it affects not just what we do here, but the way we parent, the way we relate to each other, the way we work, the way we impact our city. You see, this is breaking news. Jesus is renewing people and places and calls us to be involved in what he's doing. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this amazing story, radical news that that we have hope, that we have relationship with, with you, with each other, lives that will be renewed and transformed and, and, and our, our city, the way that can be renewed and transformed, this world, this creation. Thank you that you are up to something, something amazing. Thank you that you would use ordinary people like each one of us here to be involved in your work. So help us take next steps to allow your spirit to renew us from the inside out and help us to step out and be involved in what you're doing in the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.